you for inviting me, giving me opportunity to present our colorimeter. And this meeting, as I would like to start with a few introduction on slides. The first one is uh, about the errors versus photon counts. Suppose that we have a most typical nowadays double beam or dual image colorimeter, that is a colorimeter with plane parallel concise, summer plate, or Wollaston. Then uh, the error of normalized Stokes parameters can be found from this simple formula. We also assume here that there is no significant contribution to the sky. So here K is another efficiency, it should be close to unit. Here we have a total, and is a total number of photons registered in both orthogonally polarized stellar imaging. Of course, there might be other sources for polarization errors, such as systematic error, calibration error, errors due to the uh, telescope instrumental polarization. But this formula puts a fundamental limit. It is imposed by the nature of life. So if one wants to have sigma p, or sigma u, sigma u, at this level, 10 to minus 5, or 0.01 percent, 10 to 10 photons, or the corresponding number of photoelectrons must be somehow recorded. So the polarimeter is a photon-hungry technique. So to reduce error in n times n square more ADUs must be collected. There is another very useful formula here, which gives you a necessary signal-to-noise ratio in combined orthogonally polarized images for the desired error sigma p. So, um, Sorry, it's not <laughs> visible here, but so it can be found from this paper. And here, n is the number of half-wave plate positions. So in case of measuring linear polarization, you need at least four positions to measure one pair of stocks Q and U. And then this formula transformed to this one. That means that if you want to have a sigma 0.1%, the signal to noise 700 is required in each dual images of the each of four CCD exposures. So the, so the polarimetry requires plenty of photons. It's more sensitive to the flux in comparison with other observations, like, like photometry. And uh, of course, the definition of high accuracy in polarimetry is very good. So for AGN people, the sigma p 0.1% is comfortably small and accuracy is high. And for the hippie polarimeter group, the sigma 0.1% is shamefully large. And the accuracy is low. So, uh, the CCD camera is, of course, the best detector for the optical and near infrared wavelength range. And for the faint star, the signal to noise is indeed the main factor which limits the accuracy of CCD polarimetry. However, it's not true for the bright stars. The bright stars, you have a problem with the early pixel saturation, which is actually a CCD bottleneck. So, to avoid saturation, a very short exposure, shorter than one second, must be taken. And then you have to take many hundreds, up to thousand images to collect the desired number of photons to have a high accuracy. And because for typical CCD, the image double on time, few seconds, few tens of seconds, your observations become very inefficient. So no one wants to observe one bright star during all nights because the image double on time will be much larger than the useful exposure time. So, for the bright stars, it's very difficult in practice with a typical CCD polarimeter to get the accuracy which is given by signal to noise. So you have a lot of photons, but you have a problem due to saturation. So, of course, there are other detectors such as PMT, photomultiplier tubes, and APDs, our launch photodiodes. They are much more tolerate to high fluxes. They have an instant readout. They can be used in combination with the high-frequency polarization modulators, such as PIMs and PLCs. And because of that, these detectors has been used for most sensitive uh, polarimeters. So, up to a few years, for many years, for almost 20 years, the highest precision in polarimeter has been achieved with the polarimeters equipped either with PMTs or APDs. So the record breaker, the planet pole, the first polarimeter capable to measure polarization with the precision a few times per million was used, uh, used an APD as a detector. So uh, the HIPPI polarimeter, the latest polarimeter in this class, which routinely can measure polarization with the accuracy a few times 10 to minus 6, is also equipped, is equipped with the photomultiplier. 
But of course, the photon multipliers and APD, they cannot compete with CCD in the faint target domain. So the quantum efficiency is considerably lower and not surprising that all those records has been established only for the bright stars and with large telescopes. Nevertheless, the anticipated typical maximum precision for the CCD polarimetry is something like two times 10 to minus only. And the main reason for this is this problem with the early pixels at all. So the situation has changed some time ago when the CCDs with the fast readout appeared in the market. So this slide shows an example of one of such CCD detector, which is manufactured by Teledyne, Teledyne 2TB. And this is CCD detector, so the image in size 512 by 500 pixels. The pixel size is 16 by 16 microns. And full well depth is 180 photo electrons per pixel. It can be used with both EM and conventional amplifier. And it has a masked temporary storage area on the chip here. So when the image is acquired and very quickly shifted vertically to this masked area, and then it is transferred to readout register. So because of this design, the, this CCD provides a fast readout. So the image can be read in a split second. There is an Andor Axon 897 Ultra EM CCD camera, which is using this CCD detector. And it's a very flexible and very nice CCD. First of all, it has thermoelectronic cooling, which can cool the CCD sensor down to minus 80 below ambient. So the liquid cooling is also available as an option. It can uh, cool the CCD more by uh, approximately 20 degrees. And the readout rate with the electron amplification is up to 56 full frames per second and with the conventional amplifier is 10 full frames. It is connected to the control computer with a USB port. It provides multiple readout modes. And of course, Windows readout is also possible. And the full image vertical shift time is less than two milliseconds. It can be even shorter, can be done even shorter. And because of that, the CCD can take exposures with a permanently open shutter. So uh, it has an option for external shutter, external trigger, so the multiple cameras can be linked together with their exposures perfectly synchronized. The one camera can fire expose on another camera, so it's very flexible system which may suit every, everyone's need. So when we decided to make a new polarimeter, University of Turku, we have chosen this model as a detector. Before building the polarimeter, we have set up certain design requirements. They are listed here. So first of all, we wanted to have an instrument which is free of systematic errors, at least at the level of 10 to minus 6. We wanted to have a simultaneous observation in the three pass bands. We wanted to have a high sensitivity in B band, which is important for detect and measure polarization due to relay scattering. We want to have an instrument with a high throughput with the minimum light losses and the instrument which is suitable for mounting on various telescopes. It must be also reliable and service-free and easy to use, which assume simple calibration and simple data reduction. And of course, we wanted to have a polarimeter, CCD polarimeter, with no image saturation problem. So the Dipole UF is the last polarimeter in a series of uh, broadband imaging polarimeters that have been built in Power Lab Severity. So the first Historically, the first one is Turpo. It's still sitting somewhere in the Nordic Optical Telescope. And Dipole F is a joint project between the University of Turku, Finland, and Copenhagen Institute for Solar Physics, Germany. So Dipole F is designed and built in Pearl Observatory by Ilpo Pirola, Pirola, who is a former NOD director. Uh, so some, some of our staff members still remember him very well. So this picture shows the layout, the optical layout of the instrument. So because it's kind of a descendant of Turpol, so it inherited some of uh, key features of Turpol and other predecessors. So we have uh, the polarization union consists of two elements. We have a discreetly rotated wave plate on the top and a plane parallel calcite just behind this wave plate. And the wavelength separation is done with two uh, heroics. We have also a small 
a chromatic negative lens between the ROEG to bring images in all three cameras in focus. So the blue band channel is on the right side, our band channel on the left side, and we band channel is on the bottom. So these slides give more details about the polarimeter. So we use the super chromatic half wave or quarter wave and quarter wave plates from Bernard Halle. So the aperture size is 25 millimeters. And those wave plates are turned by Trinamic stepper motor, which is famous for stability and precision. As an analyzer, we use the plane parallel card site. There's a beam separation in the focal plane 1.8 millimeters, which is correspond to 14.3 arc seconds. So the, the wavelength separation is done with two thin dichroic beam sensitive, uh, color sensitive beam splitters. So they provide optimal performance with no much losses on uh, reflection and absorption. So three CCD cameras are used. This model under Ixon Ultra 97, and each CCD is controlled with a separate industrial grade mini PC. So the perimeter is optimized for remotely controlled observations. It can be controlled perfectly via internet from any place in the world, providing that you have a sufficiently fast internet connection. But it has been used a couple of times in the Nordic optical telescope in remote mode. So it happened in 2020 when the access to the ORM has been restricted to visitors due to the COVID. So the perimeter is also equipped with the retractable calcite unit. So the calcite can be retracted from the optical pad, and then the perimeter is converted to the high-speed three-band photometer. So this lower picture shows the stellar field image with calcite in. So all stars are double, and here the calcite is out. So switching from polarimeter to photometry mode takes Approximately 10 seconds, it is done automatically with it. So this picture shows the polarimeter. This is small black box with the polarimeter. And those three boxes are CCD cameras. And this picture shows the Dipole F mounted on the Nordic Optical Telescope Casa Gray. So officially, this instrument has been commissioned in the North in July 2019. And the information about it can be found on the Nordic Optical Telescope web page. So this is the link. And the detailed information about the instrument is published in this paper. Everyone can refer to this paper if it's necessary. So there are several highlights of the instrument. So first of all, with the CCD polarimeter, two orthogonally polarized images are recorded simultaneously. So you have no errors due to variations in transparency in scene. So uh, we can measure polarization through the scene clouds with not optimal or variable scene, providing that the target is sufficiently bright. And a single measurement cycle consists of 16 or 80 wave plate rotation, depending on linear or circular polarization models chosen. And we always turn this half weight or quarter wave plate full 360 degrees cycle. So there is this technique helps to minimize or eliminate rotationally induced internal error, which may arise from the dust particles on retarder. So last observing run in May, we have a dead mort on the surface of halfway. And uh, all the, the presence of this obstacle give the spurious polarization, which maximum value for few stars was 0.1%. All other cases, like say anti-person cases, the spurious polarization due to this mod was at the level 0.05%. So this is why we use this algorithm. So each error polarization measurements, which we given in papers or published, it's actually an average value of at least four individual measurements. And in most cases, we take 16 measurements at least. And for the bright stars, we take several hundreds of measurements and then compute the average. So there are several key features which make a polarimeter different from many other CCD polarimeters. The first feature is the focusing technique. So when we observe a bright star, we intentionally defocus the telescope. So it helps to avoid pixel saturation problem. So we spread the flux from a star on a larger pixel area. And in this way, we can collect a large 
flux inside the upper ocean diaphragm, avoiding pixel separation. We just spread the stellar image over the large pixel area, and then no saturation problem. And you can collect within this large aperture of a defocused image up to 10 to 7 photoelectrons per exposure. <clears throat> this also helps to avoid errors which can arise due to imperfect flat fielding or some CCD depth. The other technique is the elimination of the sky polarization. Now, I have been asked a couple of times why you are using the primitive plane parallel coincide instead of more sophisticated beam analysis such as the Wollaston or Savard plane. The reason is that with the plane parallel coincides, these orthogonally polarized images are split in parallel direction. And because of that, the orthogonally polarized sky images are overlapped and overlaid over each of the dual stellar images. And in this way, the sky polarization is eliminated automatically. So this is the reason why, if you have a broadband parameter, it makes sense to stick to good old plane parallel coincide. So with these tweaks, the accuracy of dipole F is only photon limited. It can be up to 10 to minus 6. That is few times, few, few parts per million. But at a precision in the level of 10 to minus 5, routinely achieved for sufficiently broad star. So for the Nordic Optical Telescope, for six magnitude star, we have this accuracy in approximately half an hour. So we have no problems with image saturation, and we can observe Nordic Optical Telescope star within very wide magnitude range. We have few stellar magnitudes up to 19, 20. No problem. So this slide just illustrates, ex explaining more details this defocusing technique. So this is an image of a defocused star which is taken with dipole two. It's just a father of dipole we have. So what you see here is the strongly defocused stellar images and the aperture, software aperture around one of this image. So the total intensity inside this aperture is 1.3, 10 to 7. And the maximum pixel value is 12,000. So we have plenty of photoelectrons and we have no problem with saturation. And because the image download in dipole F is 0.1 second, we can take hundreds of short exposures without wasting time on image download. So with this approach, the telescope polarization, sorry, the telescope polarization can be measured with the accuracy few times 10 to minus six. So normally, we observe in run, we observe not just one zero polarized standard, but from five to 10, depending on the run range. And with this technique, we can indeed determine the telescope polarization with such high precision. So I can tell you that it's an order of five, six, 10 to minus five, not the optical telescope. So it's uh, negligible for most of the practical purposes. And for, to measure the telescope polarization, we observed bright nearby stars. And normally they are observed in twilight. So, the, uh, the polarimeter uses a custom-made control software, which is based on a SDK kit provided by Andor. So, and with this software, we have a three PC, which are linked via high-speed local network. So, the control software runs on a master computer, and it is accessed via VPN connection with the VNC viewer. So the control software provides control over the all camera settings, and it displays the image acquisition process for all three cameras in real time. Uh, we have a set of templates, which we call jobs, which are uh, specially adapted for different observation modes and for different types of targets. So normally observer can edit this template on the fly and then start this job. And all this measuring cycle is executed automatically by the software. So because the CCD provides a fast readout, there is a very useful video mode, which is very useful for object centering, focusing. So the polarimeter can work in three observing modes, linear, circular, and photometry. And uh, of course, uh, the images are saved in the standard feeds format. And uh, the software does the acquisition of calibration images automatically. This is just a screenshot of the software. And an instrumental, for the instrumental polarization control, we normally observe five to 10 zero polarized plus two highly polarized stars per run. And this 
the stars can be very bright and normally they are observed in twilight. And for raw image calibration, we use a standard calibration procedure, just bias, bias and dark subtraction plus option of lead fielding. And the data reduction can be done with the, any standard aperture photometry. So what you need is to extract the intensity of this orthogonally polarized images, uh, measure the ratio of these intensities, and then those ratios can be converted to Stokes parameters. Exactly in the same way it is done for Apple. Okay, I'm, I probably skip those uh, science cases because I have no time for this. Why not? Right. Okay, so this slide just summarizes the polarimeter highlights. The first is simple and easy to observe and reduce the data. It's also reliable and service free, which means there is no preparation needed before mounting polarimeter on the telescope. When it is mounted, no service is required. It can stay days, weeks, or even months with no touching. It provides a simultaneous TV and R polarimetry, plus there is an option for high-speed simultaneous photometry. And accuracy, as I said, is photo-limited only, can be up to 10 to minus 6, providing that your star is sufficiently bright and you expose it for sufficiently long time. So it's equally suitable for bright and faint targets, and it is currently available to not community as an instrument with limited and at the end of my talk, I want to express my gratitude, the gratitude from all our research group to the NOT for hosting our instrument and special thanks to Thomas for his very positive attitude towards, towards Dipole UF and many special thanks to Carlos and Amanda for providing an excellent support for the Dipole UF. Thank you.